Well, I'm looking at BaseballSavant.com, and I see a 93.8, max out at 95.9. Welcome back, Walker Bueller. Hell of a Saturday, April 6th for you, huh? How did no, that feel in OKC? No, it was good. Uh, threw some good good breaking balls, obviously. You know, I'd like to get those numbers up a little bit more, but um, all in all, a, a pretty good day for us. On your last strikeout, um, you know when you're throwing fuel, when you see some dust come out of the catcher's glove <laughs> on your last strike, because it wasn't your first strikeout. It wasn't when your arm was completely fresh. It was the last strikeout. So can you kind of walk us through that start and how your arm was feeling inning by inning? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the biggest things of, of building back up, right. Is getting that kind of tolerance or endurance or whatever you want to call it. So, uh, you know, as inning goes, you kind of tighten up a little bit, but um you know, thankfully, I've had a little experience getting my arm going again. So, uh, yeah, it was good. That kid, uh, Beck, I think his name, I threw him a slider in his first at bat, and he, like, just missed it, fouled it off, and kind of gave, like, a, ooh, I should have killed that one. So, uh, that made me a little mad. I was glad to glad to punch him out. So, Jack, that kid, you, hold on, Jack, do you see how smiley he is right now? This dude's yeah. fired up right now. He's feeling it. He's getting close. Bubbly right now, man. He's amped. Um, that kid Beck that got pissed is Jordan Beck, who is off to like the best start in AAA that we had. So, that was a hot bat that was probably pissed that he didn't connect. And, you know, credit to you, man. Um, I, I've got a couple questions when it comes to between starts for you, because now you've made two in OKC and you're working your way back to join the Dodgers you're two in OKC I know when we talked last year um you know a, a pain point for you I guess was how you felt after the rehab outing right and this is more a build-up outing than a rehab outing how mm -hmm. did you feel between starts how did those like five six days go between outings in OKC um yeah they've been fine I think what's interesting is you know the longer you take off I think the more variance there is in how you feel bouncing back. So like my lives, you get different stuff all over the place. But, you know, I think as I've kind of progressed and now I'm throwing like 70 pitches or so, um, the soreness or like the tightness or whatever seems to be more normalized or more kind of what I remember, which is nice. Um, I think also as you get your mechanics more and more amplified or, you know, intensity builds, you're going to get closer to kind of this baseline movement or using certain muscles that you've always used. And, and so then you'll end up being, you know, more normally sore, I guess. So, um, yeah, it's definitely like a, I don't know if comforting is the right word, but it, it's kind of that more normal feeling or, or, you know, this is how I've always felt sore. So I must be throwing the ball somewhat similar to how I always have. And, um, yeah, that, that definitely is a, a positive thing. How does it feel just to feel normal? Like, it's <laughs> got to feel great. I don't know. I mean, I you know, I think it's funny. I probably, there's things that I want to feel that I remember feeling in shit, late 2020, early 2021 that, like, I was hunting in 2022, and, I, and I'm still trying to feel now. But, um, you know, you get little flashes and glimpses of it, and you just try and hold on to those. I think as as long as you can. I, I think having been off as long as I have been, there's it's kind of hard to say there's like a a normal feeling, right? I'm trying to kind of reestablish what normal is, but you know, I think for right now, consistent is is kind of good enough for me. What are some of those things that you're trying to feel? Like are are they while you're on the hill or are they outside of that? Yeah, I mean you're trying to control it all the time, right? Because you know specifically right now there's some stuff with my right leg and how that's working and, and kind of the directionality of it for me um that we're hoping helps me rotate a little bit harder and, and cleaner um you know a lot of guys are, are very leveragey when they throw and they kind of get over their front foot a lot and really bend over that front foot and that's never really how i've thrown um but i think a lot of people would say that's probably safer or more um, prototypical to do that. And so I'm kind of now trying to bust out of the the safe zone, I guess, and, and get to where I can really perform at, at a high level. And, you know, we've talked about it before. There, There's just inherent risk in, in trying to push and trying to throw 98. And, and I know we're going to get into 
some of that stuff later, but, um, you know, getting out of that rehab mindset and into like, I've got to go perform and here are like the little bit scary moves that I have to do to really do that. I think is kind of that last stage of rehab. And, and what I think is kind of sad is some guys never get out of that. Right. And, and I think that's like the big elephant in terms of coming back or return to throw is figuring out how to mentally and physically kind of push through some of those things to get to, um, to get out of, Hey, you know, my elbow could not like this to, well, I'd rather my elbow not like it and be good. Right. Then, then kind of stay in this 85% zone. You, you almost internally want to turn it into a ramp up instead of a rehab. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think, Obviously, you know, my first outing didn't go as good line wise, but, uh, you know, you want to feel that kind of adrenaline again and that you want to get as close to, to out of control as you can, right? While, while knowing what you're doing. And, and I think it's hard because, you know, I've been playing catch for, say, it's what, over a year. And, and kind of the whole base of that is to stay under control and stay within a certain parameter. And so now, you get out of that and, and, you know, you've got these four or five days in between starts where you're playing catch and you're trying to feel certain things and you want to get intensity, but it's been a long time. So you can't really judge how sore you're going to get just playing catch or how tight you're going. So there's all these little intricacies that you've got to kind of control or, or remaster, I guess, to, to be able to, you know, build your arm to this big day and, and perform. And, you know, I think in some of my lives and, and even, uh, probably my first triple game, I didn't handle that super great. And I felt really good the day before the start, but kind of did too much. And so, um, you know, there's so many like layers to it, but th there's this point where you build up enough that you're confident enough that you can kind of take it easy the day before and know it'll be there. And, you know, I, I would love to tell you that like, I could, you know, I threw the ball good in my last outing, like, Oh, I feel like I'm ready to go pitch in the big leagues. Like, yeah, maybe on that day or maybe I could throw a good inning or two or whatever, but it's all that other stuff that you're trying to kind of button up yeah. to where you can be um, productive and 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 help the team, right? Like if you can't dial your stuff in, I, I, I think there's got to be some humility and like I can't just walk out there and, and help our team. We're really talented and we have a lot of guys that can go get guys out and it's – it's the other stuff that I think really matters. Sure. Speaking about bu buttoning things up, what did you feel like? Obviously, your arm health is one thing, but then, you know, feeling the slider coming off your fingertips. What did you feel like you struggled with in start one that you then improved on from like a pitch mix? Not really just from your arm being maybe a little bit healthier in your second start. Yeah, I mean, I think I think. Hunter Fiducia and I did a little bit better in terms of being a little bit more aggressive in terms of more four seamers relying on the cutter, relying on the curveball, kind of less two seam slider change up. So more of the north south stuff as opposed to the east west stuff, which is how I pitch when I'm right. When I'm when I'm really good, it's a little less thummery than I was in my first outing. And uh for lack of a better term, like or back lack of a better term, I was kind of cute a little bit. Uh, I gave up a home run, a two seamer in on two O that I probably should have just thrown a fastball or a cutter. Um, just trying to kind of do too many fancy things at once. And as opposed to just kind of throwing the ball consistently and, and relying a little bit more on, on what I do well. So uh, Hunter did a really good job in this, in this last one. And uh, you know, I got a big out on a two seamer. That was probably only the second one I threw in that game, but I like the way he was kind of seeing the game and, and it was man on second, nobody else. You're trying to get him not to get to third. So you're not in a, in a must strike out, you know, man on third one out, you kind of have to strike the guy out. Um, so it kept me out of that and, and gave me some room to kind of navigate. So, um, you know, that's what kind of that little, those little fancy things or those little cute things sometimes you need to do. Um, I think in that first game, we just kind of did, did a little bit too much and, um so i mean you know in all fairness it's it's that guy's third time catching me in a real game so yeah 
there's an adjustment period and, and there's me also, you know, you go through these, you don't do like the big meeting, like you typically would probably, you know, in the big leagues and this big scouting and all of this stuff. And so we just kind of go and wing it. And, and sometimes you make mistakes and, and I certainly did in the first one, but you know, I think kind of went out and, and did more of, of what I do well in the second one. So after you dominate a start like that, how do we build for start three? Is it like, no hits the entire time like how do we build no i mean i think there i think at this point it's a little bit i think it's more about me and trying to get um you know some throws a little bit cleaner right like just throwing a strike in triple a can be a little bit different than it is in the big leagues right these guys can hit any pitch at any time and 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 hurt you so you know a lot of the guys in triple a can too but it's probably not quite the same um, attention to detail that you have to have. And and so, you know, I think the down away fastball command probably wasn't as good as I would want it. Uh, the slider kind of didn't play really the way that I want it. Uh, you know, I kind of had to throw a little bit more cutter than I wanted to. And, uh, you know, I think in this start, the, the curveball was a lot better. And, and, you know, that's a big one. I think that's probably the biggest indicator of where my throw is at or where my delivery is at, if I can throw a curveball kind of how I want it. Uh, typically, the other things are going to be pretty good as well. So uh, that was probably the biggest positive coming out of this one. You just spurred a thought in my mind because it. I don't think we've talked to you since your big league battery mate got his decade-long extension, so we got to get into that too. But um, I was just thinking, like, you were throwing a fiducia – you guys have an embarrassment of riches behind the dish with, with Will and Barnes at the big league level. And then you got Fiducia and Cartaya on the 40 man. And then I, I haven't mentioned Dalton rushing and Lorenzo at the lower levels at this point. Like that has to be silly. One quick thing. Um, I saw your wife McKenzie's Instagram story after the fact, sleeping baby, sleeping daughter, yeah. and then to sleeping Walker, you're an open mouth sleeper in the car. How do you feel about that? Um, were you okay with the photo or are you willing to let it roll off your shoulder or what yeah she uh she likes to snap some of those on me every once in a while and i'm i'm okay with that i had me and finley so uh we're okay with it but yeah finley did great at the ballpark she already uh she settled in nicely around the stadium and um kinsey walked around and stuff kind of showed her the sights and sounds i guess so uh yeah all in all it was it was good i was good with it is she getting the pinch of uh, cotton candy yet, or is it strictly like formula right now? We're still still very much in formula mode. Understood. You want to hear a quick story? So when I was really young, uh, my mom would feed me a ton of carrots. and Provision, right? Yeah, that, that that's all I would eat as a really young kid. And my skin turned orange. So mm -hmm. they brought me to the hospital, and they thought I was really sick. And they're like, what have you been feeding him? All carrots. But since then, I'm a huge carrot guy, but tip, a little tip, don't feed your kid only carrots. It's not a good idea. Don't, don't overfeed them on the carrots. I'll remember yeah. that. Yeah. Just no. Uncle Peter told Thank me Thank you. That. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I just don't think we're that tight yet. Sorry. We're right here. Come on. I, I can I can call myself that. <laughs> um, I do want to pivot to Will Smith because like. This is a guy that you have a ton in common with. Obviously, he was at U of L, and and he's a Kentucky guy too. And I mean, he's been catching you for what his entire career. I guess you you probably had what a year or two full season mm -hmm. in the big leagues where you weren't throwing to Will Smith. Yep. And he signs a ten year deal. Like, yep. I mean, what was your immediate reaction to seeing that? I like you had to be over the moon for your buddy. Yeah, I mean, you know. Obviously, a guy that has been kind of, you know, probably one of the most impactful catchers in in baseball, especially offensively. Kind of since he got here, there really was not a ton of of hiccup when he got up, and um, you know, definitely earned it. I, I think he enjoys playing in L.A. and and signing a deal like that obviously shows that. But right, um, yeah, very, you know, very professional player. Um, does his homework, works hard. Uh, you know, the, the catcher position is tough, man. It, it, to, to impact the game on both sides of it is very difficult. Um, and he certainly does that. And, and I know we're ecstatic to have him kind of long-term. And, and I know the timing of it was was really good for, 
for kind of both sides and and I know he's excited so you know I think at, at some point if if everyone went through and, and fine-toothed combed every valuation of, of every contract I think it's a little silly like the team's happy Will's happy and, and he's going to be here for a long time and and you know obviously his, his family's going to be very comfortable so um, you know all in all we're we're very happy for him. Can you talk about what you've seen defensively from him? Because we all know about the stick. We know he's hitting 400 and that ever since he got called up, he is just raked. Yep. But if you look at the numbers and you watch him catch, when he first came up, he was a little bit raw. He wasn't the best pitch framer in the world. He didn't have that cannon of an arm. But every year, he gets yep. a little bit better. And in the last, I would say, two years, he has been above average defensively. And then when you combine above average defensive with that stick, that's when he establishes himself as maybe the best catcher in baseball, or at least in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably since he's gotten called up, you would say he's probably been a top five catcher in baseball. You know, I, I don't think there's a ton of debating that really. Um, you know, I think his background playing infield, kind of starting catching late, I, I think – in a lot of ways is a huge advantage just because of of the athleticism that he kind of has had to play with other positions as well as you know the the wear and tear of catching is just difficult on guys and you see guys that catch from the time they're 10 years old and and by the time they're 24 years old they can barely run right and and so both of our guys on our big league team have have played infield at, at pretty high levels Barnes has played infield for us in the big leagues and um you know, both really athletic and, and obviously Barnes is is an outlier in terms of the way he frames the ball and defensively, um, you know, as good as as good as they get, especially calling games. And he's just caught a ton of big games in the big leagues. And, and I think him helping Will with some of that stuff, with some of the framing stuff, um, I, you know, I think has been super, super valuable for Will and, and for our team. So, um, yeah, I think – we probably have the best one two catching catching combo in in baseball. Now there's some other guys that play 160 games that that second guy kind of is is less important. But you know, I think the way we operate works works really well for us. And um, you know, obviously we're gonna have that kind of set up for for a while now. Yeah. I wanna pivot to Yoshinobu Yamamoto and Will caught one of his starts. Um, and Barnes caught one of his starts since he has debuted domestically. He threw in South Korea, and that was Will Smith catching that one. Um, this guy, like, I don't know, the discourse after that first start was ridiculous, and then he comes and shows exactly who he can be in his first two starts, and he's probably been on the on the very, very short list of most enjoyable watches in big league baseball so far this year. What have you seen from just, like, continuing to be around that guy how he operates and i mean even just watching it on tv that stuff is is never before seen in what kind of ways or like ridiculously unique in what kind of ways uh yeah i mean i, I don't know if obviously the the kind of routine and the training methods have, have been kind of well documented and are very unique but you know at the end of the day like you want as a major league starting pitcher you want to throw the ball hard and and where you want it um, and he does those things. He commands the ball really, really well. Um, the splitter is really good. It, I don't think it's quite as outliery as say the Senga fork thing that he mm -hmm. throws, but like we've kind of seen guys that have average splitters. Like there's no real such thing as an average splitter. Like that's a very tough pitch. And, and when you have a good one, you have a really good one. And especially when you command it, um, the way he does, I think just a, it's a really tough at bat. He's starting to make the ball go left a little bit with the cutter. And then he's throwing a lot more curveballs. And, and I think off of regardless of the velocity is, is really special. So, uh, and it's a little bit different look and, um, you know, it's kind of a smaller guy that throws really hard and, um, yeah, he's he's been fun to watch. Obviously, we're gonna get to watch him a lot for for a lot of years. But um, no, I'm excited. 
What about the young dudes, Miller and Stone? I've seen a couple yeeshes out of you. You got to be yeah. hyped to watch Miller just pound a hundred down the middle and have dudes just swing it out of their shoes. They can't touch it. And then Gavin Williams or Gavin Williams, Gavin Stone just turning that ball over for all those <laughs> on YouTube, just up. turning the ball over. These it's guys, I mean, it's got to be electric to watch them. Yeah, he's fun, man. I, you know, obviously Bobby, you know, we've seen kind of the full season of, and and I think last year, you know, Gavin ran into some tough luck and maybe it was tipping and there were some things going on, but um, yeah, I, I think he's kind of embracing what he really does well. And, you know, both starts, I guess the lines haven't been kind of as great as you would want, but if you look at kind of the underlying stuff, Gavin's throwing the ball really well. And, um, you know, then we got, you know, packs him through today and through the ball well. So, our rotation is in, in a pretty good spot, and you know we have a lot of a lot of electric stuff coming out of our rotation and, and our bullpen as well. So, um, you know, I think our team's in in a really good spot, and you know those guys are going to keep developing and getting better and better. So, uh, it's an exciting time. Yeah, Speaking Jack. Of, yeah. What would be the question about Glass now? Like, isn't it awesome? Hey, Just, man, it's isn't sick, it awesome? isn't it? Yeah. yeah, isn't it cool? <laughs> <laughs> it's super cool. He's really big, isn't he? Um, big I, man. I do need to point something out. Uh, speaking of yeesh, self yeesh. I don't love it. I didn't want to, but I got nothing else. See y'all soon, period. Did you feel, are you one of those guys that like thinks about the period at the end of your thought? Like, that's me. I overthink every period at the end of like sentences like that. So I don't know. Like analyze that tweet for me. You felt, you felt okay doing the self yeesh. Yeah. I mean, it's the first one. It, you know, I think it was the first thing I've done in a long time that was maybe worthy of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to over overanalyze it. I didn't love it, but uh, I did it. Good. You don't just throw around yeeshes. You got to earn the yeesh. Yeah, maybe in a little premature too. It's a triple A game. Uh, my second rehab start, so it might have been a little premature, but I felt okay about it. No, yeah, but you look cool. damn good. Like yeah. and when you look that good, yeah, you deserve a little yeesh. It was four and two thirds scoreless. Um, the last topic I've got for you is negative, overwhelmingly negative. But I, we talked about it a little bit before we hit the record button. Like everybody's saying their piece right now. I just watched four and a half great minutes from Justin Verlander talking about it after his rehab appearance in Sugarland. And you know, I what was it, Peter Alex Wood put something out, or was that Alex Cobb yep. that puts Alex out? Wood had a great, great Alex thread. Alex Wood had about, a great thread. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I want to open the floor to you. Like, obviously, a guy that's in it and a guy that is working his way back from this. It is a conversation I mentioned that is, like, transcending um, baseball news. It's it's just dipping into sports news as a whole because we just watched Yuri Perez, Shane Bieber, possibly Spencer Strider, Jonathan Loizaga, who knows the severity of Framber Valdez at this point, but it, it's just dropping like flies at the beginning mm -hmm. of this year. And, you know, it was obviously a serious thing in 23. It was a serious thing in 22. Um, I don't know. Like we've talked about it a lot with you and you've mentioned like, Hey, we have to push our bodies to the brink to be at the best that we possibly can be. But is this, I, what emotions is this creating in you when you see all these guys going down? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I think, this situation in particular is a little bit it's super nuanced right there there's some overarching like long-term themes in terms of velocity and then there's been major changes to the rules and so for all of those things to happen kind of simultaneously um you know i think it's obviously concerning from the jump and then you look and see the results like yeah that we were concerned for a reason right i, I think the emphasis on spin and and velocity obviously is has been what it is for years. Like I came up where velocity was was important to get recruited, to get this, to get that. Um, I think durability in terms of inning, like when quality when quality over quantity is like the overarching theme. There, there's going to be a few ways to to be quality and guys are going to follow those models. Right. And, and the best guys in our game are throwing harder with more pop or more of this or more of that. Um, and guys are modeling that. And I think that's completely normal. I think 
the best guys in the game at one point were really command and movement based and and guys modeled themselves off of that because that's what works right but the more emphasis you have on quality the the more intensity you're going to have just to get there right when you're looking at quantity there's a lot of different ways to do that right there's guys that throw sinkers and a lot of cutter and whatever but when you're just trying to punch guys out there's not that many ways to do it and so more guys are going to try and do the same things and, and those same things right now are are very stressful on the body so i think that's kind of the first thing i, I think the second thing is like most guys like yeah the time the the pitch clock is like has been a change right and i i'm not a guy that thinks the pitch clock is that um degenerative to elbows or shoulders like when you're only having two or three of those pitch clock violations every day like throughout the league like guys have adapted to it right now i think doing that continuing to alter it continuing to alter the acceptable level of use of sticky stuff Mm -hmm. um, all in once while everyone's trying to throw harder and spin the ball more like you're taking something the sticky made it easier to spin the ball better so when you take that guys are now trying to spin the ball the same as they were with it say that spin rate's 30 percent different right with or without a ball 20 percent, whatever the numbers would tell you like to throw to spin a ball 20 percent more than you are when you're already throwing 96 is almost impossible the only way that you can do it is by squeezing the ball harder and when you're getting a somewhat relatively inconsistent baseball yeah like to not be able to use anything to create a consistent feel to then create consistent pressure. Like there's just been a lot of alterations to a game that thrives on consistency. And I think elbows are one of those things that really need consistency. And so I know Alex Wood talked about different mounds and different clays and different that. I think the baseball being inconsistent is part of it. I think that was largely covered up by guys using whatever guys were using to create a consistent field for themselves. Um, I think biomechanically the throw that creates higher spin rate is a lot safer when the ball has some sort of tack or some sort of stickiness to it. If you're trying to really spin it, you need to pull left really hard. If you pull left really hard, you're going to spray more balls high arm side. If you have something on your hand that helps you keep that ball from spraying, you're also going to create more spin, even if the tackiness had no effect on the ball, which it does. We know it does. But even if that didn't, just the ability to not miss high arm side allows you to spin the ball better and with more velocity. So I think I think this thing is like super – I think the focus on velocity and spin is probably 80% of the issue. But when you have no pitch timer and you have stuff that helps you accomplish that stuff easier, then maybe that's the 20% that's changed, right? And when you're talking about ligaments that are this big in the middle of an elbow that you're trying to throw a ball 100, like 20% is a big deal. Yeah. And so I, I think I think we need to be a little more careful about making very drastic changes without really studying what is happening. We played on yesterday's show, Tyler Glasnow's two minute conversation during Ray's media availability right after he blew out. And I'm sure you saw that when he said it. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've seen it resurface in the last couple of days. I saw it resurface. I remember when he did it and you know, we said, let's, let's put this in the show because it, it just reigns as true now as it did when he said it originally. And he's at, he echoed a lot of the similar sentiments that that you just echoed too. And it's, you know, like he was never using anything egregious. He was never throwing Coca-Cola on a stovetop. He was never ordering something on Amazon. It was 
sunscreen and rosin. And it was to get grip. And he said his cue that he worked on with Kyle Snyder was to hold the ball like an egg so he could just really rest his fingers on it. All of a sudden, and like, I mean, I kind of walked through the exercise, Peter. I know you, you listen to the show. I walked through the exercise of like pinching your index and middle to your thumb and just kind of feeling all that tense up. I mean, you had to feel that uh, immediately. Did you feel a lot of the similar soreness to what he was talking about when when they did initially make that crackdown and and they made everybody go cold turkey on everything? And and we're not talking spider attack. We're talking everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you definitely do. I, I've always been a proponent of like a universal thing. I, I think it just makes too much sense for it not to happen. Like I've even joked around that I should, I feel like a hitter should hand me their bat before they hit mm-hmm. and whatever they have on their bat. I should be able to use on my hand. I like that a lot. Uh, That's sick. I've also talked about the idea of, you know, when you have like children's medicine and it's like a little cup, yeah, like that you pour that into, I think each team should have one of those on the back of the mound with whatever is legal and the team gets to use whatever's in that cup for the whole game. Whatever, if the starter needs a ton, then the bullpen doesn't have any. If if the starter doesn't use any, then the bullpen can load up or whatever, right? But then I think you can have this absolute zero tolerance policy for anything else. Like, we've, we've seen all these guys get suspended, which has largely been one umpire, and, and that's fine. It is what it is, like... Some guys are more to the letter of the law, but like whatever they say, there's always leniency one way or the other. So if you can establish a, here's the give, here's what we can use. Nothing else is legal. You will be suspended like by everyone. Then you're creating a level playing field, right? Uh, I think humidity affects the rosin that they give us differently. I think humidity affects the balls differently in different places like all of these are normal natural things but if you're looking at you're trying to universally tell every guy who's been in the big leagues for years that they can't operate the way they always have like you're going to get alterations like to outcomes to health to um you know the game everything you do has ripple effects and so i think I personally believe that Major League Baseball needs to take a real look at creating a consistent baseball. I, I think whether it's tackied or not, I think there's so much inconsistency in the way the balls come out. Seam height, ball size, some feel really heavy, some feel super light. I, I think you're just getting kind of an inconsistent feel. And um, I don't think it's unnatural for guys to – don't want a consistent feel of of something they're trying to throw. I just don't. Last one for me. I really want to go back to this Alex Wood thread uh, because I thought it was brilliant. Just because we talk about you know the tackiness, we talk about velocity, um, we talk about the pitch clock, like all the things that everybody has been talking about. But he mentioned something about the workload that mm-hmm. a lot of these pitchers are undergoing that they used to take eight to 10 weeks off in the off season, not throw it all. And then they're back on a mound in late January or February. Some guys, their first bullpen is in spring training. Now guys are throwing all the time during the off season, especially when they're young, right? Cause you, you, if you want to gain velocity, you got to keep working that arm. And then that's sometimes what leads to Tommy John surgeries. Yep. So Jack and I were also talking that obviously we're not even close to the level that you are, but even earlier on in our young playing days, like that was not the focus. Go ahead, growing, you know, I mean, like growing up, even in we both graduated high school in 2016. Growing up in that time frame, it was like it was encouraged to get soft contact early in counts, mm-hmm. and that I guess low in recent counts. years. Yeah, yeah, like low pitch counts, stuff like that. Now it's like, well, we need to get 10 Ks. We need to get 90 miles an hour. So as your training regimen or like pitchers that you've worked with coaches, have you seen just an incredible uptick in everybody throwing in the off season and now look at the results of it? No, I mean, I, I think the way that I've trained is largely similar. Um, 
even if you think about a college season, right, when you're trying to develop more, like you really develop in the fall and then try and perform in the spring, like at the big league level, you're not, you, you're trying to perform from middle of February till late June, late October, like, oh, yeah. and then now you see November, December, there's videos of guys throwing 96 all over the place at 2500 at 21 bird or whatever you know and so i mean he's completely right i have no solution for it i think every player will tell you like if somebody outworks me and is better than me like it is what it is like it, i think the days of like guys showing up and making the team the day they show up is largely gone now there's obviously exceptions there's guys that are on the team, right? Clayton's showing up and going to make the team. But, like, as a as a reliever, like, there's guys that threw the eighth innings for teams that are not making the team that year. Because there's six young guys in that organization that found a new pitch that's drastically better than anything that other guy can throw. Hmm. And so, you know, professional athletics is meritocracy, and, and that's fine, but, like, I think that's why some of the CBA changes were so big in terms of getting minimums up, getting guys rewarded for being really good early in their career, because it, I think career length is going to go down, especially in pitching. It just, it is also like there are young starters that are just as good as I was. So like when I'm talking about these rehabs and like what I want to feel like it, it's very difficult to take four and two thirds in triple a when I didn't walk anyone and struck out some guys and be like satisfied with it. And I think that's a good thing. And in general, I really do, but you are kind of treading on that. Like you're the, the game's biggest stars, which I don't think I'm one of, but you talk Spencer Schreider, you talk all of these guys, like there are people that want to watch Spencer Schreider throw for 15 years. And like this surgery puts that, or this injury throws that up in the air. Like fans, Fans, I believe, tune in to see the best players that they know. They know their names. They know how good they've been for the past 10 years. Like, we have a bunch of them. Like, we have the biggest attendance in the league. We get watched on TV a lot because we have Mookie Betts. We have Freddie Freeman. We have Shohei. We have Clayton Kershaw, who's been doing this for 17 years at an extremely high level, right? There is an expectation of what you're going to get to watch when Clayton Kershaw Clayton Kershaw starts a baseball game. And I think that's a valuable part of our game. So I really don't have any solutions to it. I could kind of go on about the pros and cons of everything, but it just kind of sucks. Like you're just not going to get the same career length and fan follow along a player's career value. The back of the baseball card is really going to change. And I think it already has. So it's kind of a sad thing, but it, it's something you have to adapt to as a player. And, um, you know, like I'm, as I said, like I, you can't be satisfied with, with doing what I did two days ago, which I think largely 15 years ago or 10 years ago, you'd be like, yeah, that's great. Like, I don't care how hard he was throwing. Like I care about how hard I was throwing because guys can hit that at most levels of baseball. Now I just got lucky and made the right pitches at the right time. But if the movement wasn't correct and the velocity is not correct, then the kind of assumption that comes into major league baseball players minds now is like big leaguers can hit that. Yeah. Like good big leaguers will hit that. That four and two thirds doesn't look the same in the big leagues because the bar is so much higher. Yeah. Mm. That was, I mean, that was awesome. <laughs> that was, that was incredibly Insightful. honest and genuine. And I want to thank you on behalf of everybody that's going to listen and watch this for, for doing that. Cause like, and not trying to, not trying to like sap you up at the end of this pot, but like, listen, we got a very poignant and honest Justin Verlander and we got a very honest Tyler Glass. Now when shit hit the fan and we're getting very honest pitchers and it is like, we know from talking to you from the last year, how much you think about this game and how invested and passionate you are about this game. And for you to be willing to share that with the audience that ingest this show is, is 
cool. And they're not going to take that for granted. So on behalf of everybody and, you know, like you hop in, hop in the comments or hop in Peter's DMs, don't come into my DM or Walker's DM and say like, no, we hated it. But like on behalf of everybody else, thank you for doing that. I'm going to go eat. Yep. Yeah, go my, eat. My, DM, my DMs are filled with uh, people bitching about me losing bets. So I don't need any more. That yeah. happens. All right, Walker, <laughs> you're the man. Catch you. All right. See you guys.